excited to welcome you all here this morning on this beautiful Indiana winter day um, to uh, really join with small college basketball in what has become a long overdue um, recognition and celebration. Would you guys join me in a word of prayer as we get started this morning? Father God, we are thankful for another day and we are thankful for this opportunity to join together this morning. Um, we recognize that over this past year, many of our earthly celebrations have been disrupted or delayed, but we are so, so grateful that we can daily celebrate your goodness and faithfulness in our lives. I pray that as we continue um, throughout this season, that you would um, keep your hand of protection over our team um, as they look to finish this season um, in really exciting ways, um, giving all the glory to you. Be with us today, in Jesus' name, amen. I know um, the guys have a pregame routine to keep, so we're gonna get right into it. I'm gonna turn things over to John from Small Calls Basketball. Well, welcome. It's uh, obviously a thrill to be here, and as Hannah had mentioned, a bit long overdue. We were supposed to be in Kansas City with the National Awards show, uh, geez, almost a year ago or nine months ago for the uh, presentation of Bebo Grant's award, and obviously things have changed uh, due to COVID. And I want to start off with uh, a few comments, if you will, about the Bebo Francis Award itself. And uh, I want to start off a little bit with my story and how I learned about Bebo Francis. I grew up in Northeast Ohio and uh, took a recruiting visit as a sophomore with a senior who could actually really play and was really good and was being recruited by uh, Rio Grande. And we went to uh, Bob Evans Farm, uh, which is literally across the street from campus, the original Bob Evans Farm. And we sat uh, with Coach John Lawhorn at that time, talking with my, my friend Gary Boyce about Rio Grande. And of course, the legend of Bebo Francis came up. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, I learned about Bebo Francis and Bob Evans were the two things I knew about the University of Rio Grande here shortly. But from that time on, I knew about Bebo Francis and this remarkable story. And I won't spoil it all for a moment because Jeff Lanham, the athletic director at Rio Grande, is going to talk a little bit about Bebo Francis. But it's amazing to me how things have come full circle, if you will, that years later I had the unbelievable privilege and honor of nominating and then inducting the Bebo Francis into the NAI Hall of Fame and had an opportunity to attend the Bebo Francis Classic back on campus and sit at the head table next to Bebo Francis and Newt Oliver and, and speak about the incredible story of the Rio Grande Redmen of 1952 through 1954. And again, Jeff Lanham will tell the story and it is absolutely remarkable. But when I approached Jeff about creating the Bebo Francis Award, uh, I'm not sure I even finished my sentence when he said yes. Uh, and from the very beginning, we had two major purposes, two primary purposes for the creation of this award. One was to keep the legacy of Bebo Francis alive. And number two is to honor a group of today's finest players and ultimately the player who had the finest season of anybody in all of small college basketball. I just really want to thank Jeff Lanham for believing in me and believing in this award and the purpose of this award. To begin with, we awarded the first inaugural Bebo Francis Award to Dominiz Burnett from Davenport University, and Jeff and I took the visit there. And then in 2017, we went to Northwest Missouri State, and the award went to Justin Pitts. The following year, we created the National Awards Show, and the award went to Emmanuel Terry from Lincoln Memorial. And then in 2019, to Aston Francis, from Wheaton, and then of course we are here today to present the 2020 Bebo Francis Award to Kyle Mangus from Indiana Wesley. But a few notes on this specific award so that we have some clarity about the award itself. The award is a season award as opposed to a career award. And we use the following uh, to choose the winner, choose the finalists, etc. We use statistics, awards, milestones, team success was important, and ultimately personal character. And we had great discussions with our committee and ultimately with Jeff Lanham and the staff at Rio Grande to ultimately choose the winner. I'll be back to talk a little bit more about 
Kyle and why we chose Kyle, and to congratulate all the finalists for the 2020 award. But I'd like to turn it over now uh, to Jeff Lanham, the athletic director of the University of Rio Grande, who helped make this happen, to talk about the wonderful and great Bebo Grimms. John mentioned I'm here as, uh, representing the University of Rio Grande. Um, I, I'm born and raised uh, in Rio. I've been there, been working there for 32 years. Um, and it, it's right. It didn't take me much to say yes that we want to follow through with this uh, award. And I want to thank John too for, um, for coming up with this vision that he has. It's just it's unbelievable to, to think how where this has come and where we're going to go with this. Um, you know, we, we kind of look at this as the, the best college basketball player in, in the United States. We, we think it's similar to the Heisman Trophy. Um, it would be very, very same thing. And when the Heisman was first introduced, very few people knew about it. And it, this is going to grow and grow and grow. So we're just so... So pleased that we're able to able to do this. So I, I want to want to want to think about something here. I believe that when you define a famous individual, that um, you look back and you remember the day, uh, you remember the time, you remember what you were doing, who you were with when you first heard about that person, that legend. And for me, like I said, I was born in Rio Grande. My dad happened to be the athletic director and basketball coach at Rio at that time. Um, and I was nine years old and realized then, I didn't realize then, it was now that that was the first time that I ever met the legend of Bebo Francis. Eating dinner in my dining room that day. So I look back at that and I can tell you who was there. I, I can remember all the things. So today, today we're honor, honoring a tremendous basketball player. It, he, he can flat play. We all know that, right? Because I think in the future, all of us in here are going to know that day. You're going to know the first time you heard the name, and you're going to know, I remember the first time I saw him play, and you're going to remember what was going on, who I was with, because he, he, he is a legend. And congratulations to Kyle so much for this. He is a legend. Um, and, and I got to see Kyle play. I haven't seen him play face to face. I haven't seen him until today. I'll get to see him with Mount Vernon today. Um, but Kyle, he played, we played, played Rio a few weeks ago. Um, and oh gosh, I thought he was going after Bebo's record. He was nine for nine to start the game, ended up with 32 points. Um, which is uh, just, again, showing that, showing that he can flat out, flat out play. We appreciate that. Um, so we want, we want to talk about a little history about what's happening here here with, with uh, Bebo Francis and what's going on. But first, I want to ask you a question. We'll talk about the answer a little bit later. How does a team score 134 points? Think about this, 134 points, and nobody playing the game scores double Nobody scores double figures. So, Vivo Francis, he could play too. He could, he could flat score. Great jump shooter. We've got a little video here. Um, hope you enjoy it. Just a, just a few minutes. I'm going to try to see if I can get it. Oh. Funding and support for this program provided by the College of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, with additional production support from WOSU Public Media and Blue Skies HD Video and Film Productions.
The following is a Painted Rock production. Maybe once in a lifetime a story comes along. Who knows? I don't believe that I know because I'm living. A story so vivid yet imperfect enough to be the stuff that legends are made of. We had 38 points in a whole column. But we had eight people that could play the game of basketball. This is the story of the Rio Grande Redmen. They roar from the hill country of Southeast Ohio. Their college about to go broke. Yet this team did more than just stand college basketball on its ear. That was a hell of a tail pitcher. That was a night Beagle scored 113 points. <laughs> February 2nd, 1954, Rio Grande played the Michigan team in a sold-out high school gym in Jackson, Ohio. It was the closest the Redmen had to a home game that season, and from the opening tip-off, Bebo Francis scored almost every time he touched the ball. It seemed like everything was shot, I mean, it felt good. Every shot felt good, and then they were stopping. Players from both teams raced up and down the court in a fast-paced game that was energized by the cheering crowd. Bebo Francis slipped from everywhere on the court. He had that running jump shot, and then he had underneath the basket that sweeping hook that he would put it in from about eight, ten feet away. Everything went in. Soon, the crowd realized that Bebo Francis was on pace to break his own national scoring record. At the half, he had 42 points. The pedal was to the battle. He was hitting everything he shot. I told him at the halftime, I said, this is the night he gets his record back. In the third quarter, Hillsdale's players were swarming around Francis, several fouling out of the game. They tried everything to keep Francis from scoring. It made little difference. Francis scored 31 more points. Every time he got the ball, there were three guys on. Francis broke free, rose into the air, and released the ball. It rarely missed. The more the game went on, the better I got. In the final quarter, Bebo was averaging two points every 30 seconds. He was in his zone. Like I said, like a drop kick that over an inch. <laughs> Bebo scored 39 points in the fourth quarter. The Redmen won 134 to 91. And Bebo Francis finished with 113 points. We averaged more than 100 points a game. Bebo Francis was averaging more than 50 by himself. The Redmen captured the hearts and imagination of an entire nation. A fiery coach named Newt, a tall, skinny country boy, people called Bebo, and a team that refused to surrender. This is a story that needs to live on for generations and generations to come. The Redmen didn't just play to win, they played to save their school. They didn't know it then, but they may have also saved the game of college basketball. They could really play the game. Basketball is a team sport, it's not a nice sport. Funding and support for this program provided by the College of Journalists. Okay, um, that, that's Coach Oliver who was speaking there at the, at the end. Um, a, a fiery coach that um, Sally, uh, he always talked about how um, he just his comments that he made just fit him to a T, you know. So 113 points. Um, that, that record lasted for 58 years. Bevo always said because of the three-point line, somebody would get the record. So on November 20th, 2012, Jack Taylor from Grinnell College set the scoring record. Um, he had 138 in a game. And we go, whoa. That's big time, right? So let's look at the stats. Jack took 108 shots by himself oh. in that game. He took 108 shots and made 52 of them, all right? 27 of those were threes. He made 27 threes, seven for 10 from the free throw line, 138. That's just unbelievable when you think about that, just unbelievable. Um, so let's look at Bebo. Bebo took 70 shots the day he scored 113. He made 38 of those 70. This is what's kind of amazing. 
He talked about all the people fouled out of the game because when he crossed half court, they fouled him. There was not one-on-one at that time. He only got one shot. So they fouled him to keep him from scoring two. He only could score one. He shot 45 free throws that game himself. He made 37 for 45 from the free throw line. Plus, they didn't have a three-point line as well. So if, if we go back and we take, make those 27 threes into twos, Jack only had 111. Just saying, right? Just saying. Uh, it was an unbelievable game, unbelievable uh, contest that he had there. Think about this. He did. Average 50 points a game. He scored over 3,200 points in two years. He was only a rider for two years. He scored 3,200, over 3,200 points. Uh, 14 times he scored 60 or more during that time. And six of those times he scored 70 or more points in a single game. And that, if people talk about the scoring that he had and, and all the accolades that he had from that, could, he could score. We have a, as John mentioned, we have Bevo Francis uh, Classic. Um, next year will be number 38. 38 years that we've had this tournament. We bring in four women's college teams and four men's college teams. Part of it is good basketball. The other part of that is the idea that we want to tell the story. We have a banquet. Um, we, we had Bevo is there. Bevo came for 32 straight years. That stopped him. He, he passed away in 2015. Um, he, had, he had cancer, lost his battle with cancer. Um, but he, every time I ever heard him talk about the team, talked about that night, talked about the, the time he had at Rio Grande, he never failed to mention his teammates. He never failed to mention his teammates. Um, he always said, there was no, I could have done none of this. They, they were very, they were pretty good, uh, along with just him, not just him. Um, so I, I just think it's just so important. He, he was he was so humbled by all of this. Um, February the second, just a few weeks ago, anniversary of this of this night, 113. And I, I talked with um, his wife Jean, um, who's who's still still living, and I, I just you know. Tell me, where were you on that night? Do you remember all of that back in 1954? She said, sure, I was at home. They were married. They had a little, they had Frank Jr. Um, you know, and I said, well, when, when Bezo came home from the game, I mean, did he walk in and go, I mean, I was on tonight. You know, I mean, did he give that kind of, did he say, you know, golly, I couldn't miss anything. You know, and, and she said, Frank, never. Frank, that's what she thought this, Bezo's name was Frank. Frank never talked about his games. He went to bed that night, didn't even tell her that they won. The next day, he find, she finds out about all the scoring and all the things that happened. She didn't even know about that. And that was the kind of individual that, that Bevo was. He was very humble. And to, to the day of his death, he, and he always referred to that. Anytime we had anything in it, he always said, include my teammates. Always. So, you know, by, by, by saying that and being, being involved with that, I, 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 uh, I just want to, want to say to you, Kyle, that always, sometime today, sometime this year, sometime before you're finished here at West End, thank, thank your teammates. Thank your teammates for the, how important that is for them to, to be here with you um, and how important it is um, for you that you're receiving. you got to have the right kind of teammates to make all that kind of thing happen. So, back to the last question I, I get off here and get going. 134 points. How does nobody score double digits, right? One guy scores 113. Right? The next guy was nine. So it's the next guy. So, I, again, congratulations um, so much for this. We are, we are so proud to be a part of this. And what I always say this, tell somebody. Tell somebody about what you saw here. We've got, we've got some books and videos that we've got involved with this and documentaries.
tell someone about Devo Francis and about what happened in that 52, 53, 52, 54 season. And that was a long time ago. We're looking at the way they played and the whole part of that. But it was absolutely amazing what they were able to do. I could go on for a long time talking about it. We're going to continue. And Coach is coming up here. Okay? Thank you guys very much. Congratulations. Jeff, thank you for uh, that context. There, there are a lot of times in practice or in games when uh, Kyle goes on one of his scoring sprees and our guys refer to him as Devo. But now they've got more context for you know, what that may mean. Just want to thank a few people um, you know, for making this possible. And, and I know anytime you do this, you risk leaving somebody out. But John, thank you for your passion for, for small college basketball and uh, for your extra love for Indiana Wesleyan. Uh, we appreciate all you're doing. The, the passion at which you do it um, truly represents what this game is all about, so thank you. Uh, thank you to Bebo. Uh, it's an honor for not only Kyle to carry on this legacy, but Indiana Wesleyan becomes a part of this legacy as well. And you better believe we will be telling this story and, and spreading the word. I really want to thank Indiana Wesleyan, and there's a ton of people to thank. Um, <clears throat> but Dr. Wright, I want to thank you. Um, I think one of the hardest things in leadership is, is to, to rally a group of individuals or, or people around a single mission. And, and Dr. Wright does that at a high level, and he's embedded our program into that and a small part of that. I think Mark DeMichael, um, who was the athletic director and now is over athletics, uh, he's just got a gifting for unifying a group of people. And you've taken 18 programs and have just given us one purpose. And uh, we're a living legacy of that now as, as you lead you know, above us. So thank you for that. And just the entire administration uh, for giving our guys an opportunity to do what they love. When we don't take it for granted, especially in the year of COVID, when, when we didn't know if we would be playing. The fact that we are now playing tonight our 29th game. I say, man, I got to give to that. Don't we, fellas? So we're here to talk about Kyle Mangus, and nobody hates that more than Kyle Mangus. So he's going to be a little uncomfortable for the next couple minutes, but I'm going to be quick because I need you being comfortable for the next 40 minutes in our big game today, Kyle. But I'm just going to tell you a quick story on how Kyle Mangus continues to prove us wrong. Uh, it's taken me a, a little bit to, to, to recognize and admit that I'm wrong often, but, but Kyle continues to, to prove that. And the first way is that fundamentals uh, are still important in the game of basketball today. And I'll be honest, when I first saw Kyle play, it was almost eight years ago. And I was impressed, but I wasn't that impressed. Then I walked up and saw the box score and thought, gosh, he had 30 points. How did I miss, you know, 25 of those? The same thing with the rest of our staff. As we watched him, we'd walk away impressed, but yet, I don't know, just always asking, like, what's going on? Because we'd go up and check the stat sheet, and it was 30 points, 10 rebounds, 8 assists. But the more we watched him, the more we could realize how fundamental Kyle is. And I, I still get that from a lot of people today. In fact, I was working my, my boys out this week, and one of them got mad at me and said, why are we doing uh, up and unders right now? And why are we doing the mic and drill? And I said, because Kyle Mangus does the mic and drill, boys. And they looked at me and said, oh, well, Kyle does it. You know, we'll do it. But Kyle's a fundamental player. And if you watch him, you can appreciate the pure aspect of basketball. And you can, and you can appreciate the tireless times that he has put in the gym uh, doing that. The other time Kyle proved me wrong was uh, as I walked off the court in 2017, Kyle was a senior in high school and had committed to us. And we had just graduated two 2,000-point scores. And we were, uh, got beat in the final four. We were on the bus ride home, and I was a little down. And the staff was asking me, you know, why were you down? We made it to the final four. We won 30-some games that year. And I just said, well, I don't want to rebuild next year. I'm just not a rebuilder. I've enjoyed being on top. And we talked about what we had coming back. And we kind of focused on what we had lost, two 2,000-point scores. But... We had no idea this freshman would come into our gym and pretty much break every freshman record. He would become the first conference <coughs> player of the year as a freshman. He would become the first freshman MVP of the national tournament and lead us to our second national championship. And it was a pretty quick turnaround for Kyle to prove me wrong, but once again, I appreciate you proving me wrong, Kyle. 
Lastly, I'll tell you that where Kyle's proved me wrong, I've always seen humility as a sign of weakness, or at least potential weakness. Especially in the game of basketball, where you're supposed to dominate, you're supposed to coerce, you're supposed to use strength. Kyle continues to prove us all that humility is actually a form of strength. See, I've realized that I don't coach basketball, I just coach people. And let me tell you about Kyle Mangus, the person. The guys in this room know, but those that are watching online, I really want you to learn about Kyle Mangus, the person, because Kyle's taught us all in this program probably more than we've taught him. I doubt there's ever been a player to score 3,000 points in his career without ever once showing up his opponent in any way. And there's been times where I, as a coach, have wanted Kyle to show up his opponent. He's maybe talking a little trash, or maybe got under his skin, but Kyle just continues what Kyle does. He scores, he runs to the other end, and he plays good defense. Show me another player who in his junior year got National Player of the Year, but found a way that next summer to just strive and grind and become an even better basketball player. I have said this over and over after his freshman year, I said, well, it's gonna be hard to top that. And then after his sophomore year, I said, I have no idea how he's gonna be able to top that. And after his junior year, I really did concede and say, there's no way he's topping that. Well, here we sit in Kyle's senior year, and I think everybody would agree, he's topped that. And here's something I think for all the young hoopers out there, the, the kids that are striving to become the best basketball players they can be, but having a short memory is one of the things that, make Kyle, that makes Kyle very great. Kyle can miss four or five shots in a row, and you wouldn't know if he just made the last four or five in a row. Kyle can have bad calls made against him, and you'd have no idea. He just continues to play and he continues to be steady. And I think that's a trait that has made him very successful. You see, the longer I coach, the less impressed I am with basketball talent and the more impressed I am with what somebody's teammates say about them. And if you really wanted to make today's ceremony special, we would have had time for each and every teammate to stand up here and to talk about Kyle Mangus as a person because at the end of the day, that would impress people the most. What do his teammates say about <clears throat> who he is? Our teammates would tell you this, that in Kyle's senior year, he has become the ultimate leader. He has invested into the lives of his teammates. He has become a spiritual leader. Every single day, he's pouring into young guys, teaching them about what it means not only to be a great basketball player, but to be a follower of Christ. And to me, that's the ultimate compliment, and that's the ultimate form of leadership. You see, somebody, someday, is going to put on the next Kyle Mangus uniform and carry on Kyle's legacy. I doubt they'll surpass all these accolades. I, I doubt they'll get any of these numbers, but they're gonna carry that legacy of what does it mean to be a Christ follower who loves the game of basketball and who doesn't play for himself, but embodies what we call I am third. God first, others second, yourself third. And if young guys who, who don the Indiana Wesleyan Wildcat uniform continue to do that, they will have carried on the legacy of Kyle Mangus. So Kyle, from your teammates to your coaches, to everybody here, I want to thank you for being that type of leader. We respect that. So I want to add a couple of tidbits, if you will, uh, about Bebo Francis. I could, like Jeff, get on a roll and have tended to do that in the past. But a couple things I want you to know, uh, in addition to the scoring accolades uh, that Bebo had. Uh, primarily this, in 1952, when Bebo arrived on campus, behind the scenes, the administrators, the board of directors at Rio Grande had made the decision that at the end of the 1952-53 academic year, they were gonna close the school. There literally was less than 100 total students and I believe Jeff was at 39 students, I'm sorry, boys on campus, 38 boys on campus total at the school. They just simply didn't have the revenue to keep the school alive. However, when Bebo Francis showed up, things changed and they changed quickly. What I think that the video didn't get to, it just uh, there's so much more to tell, was the fact that the season before Bebo arrived, they were awful, they, to be blunt. They won four games the year before he arrived. His freshman year, not only did he average 50 a game, as the story told, but they went 39-0. and 0, And Bebo became the most popular player literally in the world at that point. And so they realized they couldn't close the school. Bebo Francis is here. He's the most popular player in the world. So what they decided to do his sophomore year was move every single game 
to an away game so that they could cut, cut a deal where they could collect the gate money or guarantee money. And the coach would bring back, New Dollar would bring back the checks to the president of the university, and the president would say, thank you, we can pay the professors this week. And because of Bebo Francis, literally, he saved the school. And now today we have the University of Rio Grande, a thriving university with over 2,000 students at the university, in great part because Bebo Francis literally saved the school because it became so popular that they paid so much money. They ended up playing in Madison Square Garden. Uh, they ended up playing in, in the Boston Garden. They ended up playing all over the country because everybody wanted to get a glimpse of the great Bebo Francis. And if I fast forward, uh, just two quick stories on how popular he became is when they played the away games, they were often sold out games. So there's the stories of people climbing trees outside of this arena so that they could get to the third or fourth floor where there was glass so they could look down in the glass to look down in the arena so they could be able to tell their children that one day they saw Bebo Francis play. Incredible stuff. And when I sat next to him, uh, having the wonderful opportunity to speak at the Bebo Francis Classic, I remember him leaning over and telling me a story. At that time, they didn't travel like we travel. They traveled in their cars. So, of course, he was married, as Jeff mentioned, and uh, was, was in his car with his wife traveling to Cincinnati for a game from Rio Grande. And he told me that uh, he's driving along the, hi the highway, and all of a sudden he sees the red and the blue sirens behind him. And he looks at a speedometer, and he looks behind him, and he says, geez, I, I wasn't speeding. I don't know why he's pulling me over. And the officer came over uh, next to him uh, after he pulled over. And before the officer could even speak, Bebo turned to him and said, uh, officer, I, I wasn't speeding. I was looking at my speedometer. I know I, I wasn't speeding. And the officer looked at him and said, well, I didn't pull you over for speeding. He said, well, what did you pull me over for? He said, when you drove by, he said, I thought it was Bebo Francis. So I pulled your plates and realized it was you. He said, so I just want to see if I get tickets to the game tonight. So <laughs> he became so popular that everybody knew the name Bebo uh, at that time. And I want to fast forward now to why we're here today, of course, is to honor, uh, honor Kyle uh, Magnus today. But I want a quick point of clarification uh, so everybody is aware. When we use the term small college basketball, what we're referring to is all four-year college basketball that is not NCAA Division I. So in today's world, that's NCAA Division II, NCAA Division III, the NAI, the USCAA, and the NCCAA. And therefore, we're representing over 1,100 colleges and universities around the country. Mathematically, therefore, on a typical year, there's about 13 to 16,000 uh, men's basketball players at the varsity level. So if we fast forward, I'm sorry, go back to January 15th uh, of the 2019-2020 season, we put out a watch list of 100 players. And that in itself is quite impressive to be on that list when you're one of 100 players out of 13 to 16,000. And then on February 15th, we limited it down to 50 players, March 15th to 25 players, and then in between games, the NCAA Division I Final Four, we released the video of the finalists for the award and then announced Kyle as the winner at halftime of the NCAA Division I National Championship game. So I want to take a moment to honor and recognize all of the 14 finalists. If you think that you're a finalist for the Bebo France Award, that is only 14 players in this year out of 13 to 16,000 players. Uh, that's an incredible season that each of them have. So bear with me for a moment as I recognize each of those players that were finalists for this award. It was Chris Coffey at Georgetown College, Zacchaeus Darko Kelly from Providence College in Montana, Jonathan Dunn at Southern Nazarene, Brett Hansen at Florida Southern, Ryan Hawkins at Northwest Missouri State, Trevor Hudgens from Northwest Missouri State, Mark Matthews from Nova Southeastern, Salome Mogabe at Azusa Pacific, Nick Reed at Olivet Nazarene, Jake Ross at Springfield, Andrew Sisko at Damon, and Nate West at Letourneau, obviously Kyle as well. But I'd like to tip my cap and congratulate and honor all 14 finalists for the 2020 Bevo Francis Award. Each and every one of them had an incredible season. Now, I think everyone here is aware that we're here to honor Kyle Mangus from Indiana Wesleyan. So let me tell you about why we selected Kyle as the winner. As previously mentioned, this is a season award, and we look at statistics and awards and milestones. 
team success, and ultimately personal character. And for those that know Kyle well, everybody here today, I think you know that he checks all those boxes. So let me tell you about the 2019-2020 season in regards to the Indiana Weston Wildcats and about Kyle Mangus. Kyle helped lead the team to a 29-4 record, including a 17-0 record at home. They won the regular season and conference tournaments in the Crossroads League. And prior to COVID-19 canceling the season, they had won their conference tournament games respectively by 32 points and 27 points, and then 32 points in the conference championship game. During his junior year, Kyle averaged 26.9 points, 6.4 rebounds, and 4.2 assists while shooting over 55% from the field and 83% from the free throw line while also leading his team in steals. He was named the Crossroads League Player of the Week six times and the National Player of the Week two times. For the third straight year, Kyle was named the Player of the Year in the Crossroads League, and for the third straight year, he was named first team in AI All-American. During the season, he surpassed the 2,000-point milestone, and then he became the all-time leading scorer in Indiana Wesleyan history, finishing his junior year with 2,479 points. At the conclusion of the season, Kyle Mangus was named the NAI Division II National Player of the Year. I think it's pretty obvious that Kyle checks the boxes in regards to statistics, awards, and milestones. But let me share a few personal notes. At this point, I think I've probably watched 50 plus Indiana Wesleyan games, and I've watched them closely. Myself and others have done a tremendous amount of research on Kyle on and off the court. This award is named after the great Bebo Francis, and Jeff Lanham, myself, and our committee take that very seriously. We want high quality people to represent this award. And frankly, there's a lot of really good, accomplished players in this country. But let me tell you about what I've observed and what I've learned. I've learned that Kyle is quiet, and humble, and kind, and an incredible teammate. Frankly, from what I've learned, he's probably not enjoying all this attention today. I've watched him on the bench, cheering on his teammates. I've watched him and learned about Kyle that as a human being. He doesn't cuss, and he's respectful of his teammates, and he's respected by his teammates. And I think part of the reason he's so respected by his teammates is the fact that he's so respectful to his teammates. And what I've been told over and over about Kyle is this. You should meet his parents. And then you'll know why he's so special and such a wonderful young man. He was raised by terrific parents. Humble and kind keep coming to mind when people describe Kyle Mangus. But something keeps sticking out in my mind. There was a game last year when Kyle was just about to break the school's all-time leading scoring record. And he gets a steal at half court. I remember this specifically. It sticks out in my mind. He's all alone for a wide open layup, but what does he do? He turns around and pitches it back to Seth Maxwell for the dunk. Who does that when you're just about to break the school's all-time leading scoring record? But it comes back to thinking about this thought that kept coming through my mind. I just saw a simple play. He could have laid it in and grabbed another two points and got that much closer. But it just occurred to me then that he really doesn't care who gets the credit. He really doesn't care about just scoring. But then I also think, I also saw someone between that moment and watching on the bench cheering for his teammates and watching his excitement when others score, that I watch somebody who's genuinely happy and excited when his teammates do well. And then I remember what Greg Tonham has taught me about the I Am Third culture. And here, I'm watching the human embodiment of the I Am Third culture. And frankly, it's beautiful to watch and witness in action. In regards to basketball, I've used a few phrases about Kyle over the last several years. I tell people, if you want to learn how to play this game, watch Kyle Mangus. I've told people he's just remarkably effective and efficient. He has advanced understanding of how to play this game, and frankly, it's just beautiful to watch. It's like watching a basketball clinic. I think something, though, that goes unnoticed and something that's not talked about much is this. Part of the reason, and a great part, of why he's so effective and so efficient is he works so hard and plays so hard on both ends of the court. I can tell you, it's not an accident that he gets that many layups. He outran people down the court to get those layups. 
It's not an accident that he gets so many putbacks. Frankly, he just outworked people to get in position to get that putback. Here's a player who's the player of the year in the country, our Bebo Franks award winner, and he dives after loose balls. He takes charges, and he literally sprints down the court both ways, time after time after time. He's so consistent in his work ethic. But as I mentioned, we're not awarding the 2021 Bebo Franks Award due to the impact of the virus. But now I've watched about 90% Indiana Wesleyan's games this season. And after watching them play so many times, I want to finish with this observation. I've now been involved in collegiate basketball for 25 plus years now in various capacities. And I've watched a lot of college basketball. My wife and others may tell you even to a little bit of an unhealthy level. Um, I watched a lot of basketball over the years, whether it's when I was coaching or running the NAI National Tournament or now with small college basketballs. And during my 25 plus years of observing NAI basketball, Kyle is the most consistently effective and efficient NAI player I've ever seen. Not just last season, not just this season, but of this generation. The most effective and efficient, consistent player that I have seen in NAI basketball in this entire generation. Congratulations, Kyle Mangus, on winning the prestigious Bebo Francis Award. It's an absolute pleasure to watch you play, and it's wonderful to hear people tell me over and over and over, yes, Kyle's a great player, but he's even a better human being. If you don't mind, I'd like to Take a look at the video, and we'll bring Kyle Mangus up. On behalf of the University of Rio Grande, Small College Basketball is proud to announce the winner of the 2020 Bebo Francis Award is Kyle Mangus from Indiana Wesleyan. Kyle Mangus is a six foot three junior from Indiana Wesleyan that led the Wildcats to a 29 and four record, a Crossroads League regular season and tournament championship and a berth into the NAI Division II tournament. For the season, Mangus averaged 26.9 points 6.4 rebounds and 4.2 assists per game while leading the team with 59 steals and shooting over 55% from the field and over 83% from the free throw line. During the course of the year, he surpassed the 2,000 point barrier and then broke the school's career scoring mark, finishing the season with 2,479 points heading into his senior year. He was named the Crossroads League Player of the Week six times and the NAI National Player of the Week twice. For the third straight year, Mangus was named the Crossroads League Player of the Year. And for the third straight year, he was named first team NAI Division II All-American. And ultimately, Kyle Mangus was named the NAI Division II National Player of the Year. Congratulations to Kyle Mangus, the winner of the 2020 Bevo Francis Award. basically just shoot bank shots, which my teammates all make fun of me for. 
Uh, I've never been close to the fastest, the strongest, the tallest, or quickest players, so I have a deep appreciation for guys who just know how to play the game the right way. Reading about Vivo Francis and his story, it seems as if he was just that type of player. He had a smooth stroke and could score from both inside and out, and obviously scoring over 100 points in a game is incredible. It's truly an honor to be recognized for this award under Vivo's name. When I was a freshman back in 2018, I didn't quite know how good NAI basketball was, and specifically the Crossroads League. It blew me away just how skilled these players were, how competitive the games were, and the togetherness that these teams played with. We are given the spotlight of Division I teams, but I quickly realized that most small college teams play really good basketball. I think the perception is changing as people are starting to respect the elite ability for all levels of college basketball. For my journey, it was important for me to find a school where I shared the same values as my coaches and teammates. I knew IWU was the, was the right fit from the beginning. It has been so fun to play in a culture that emphasizes qualities such as fearlessness, selflessness, and joyfulness. When you choose to be a part of Indiana Western basketball, you're choosing to be a part of something bigger than yourself. At times throughout my career, I have struggled with basing my identity on my basketball performance and the expectations that I, that I put on myself. I want to thank my teammates and coaches for constantly pouring their love into me and reminding me that my identity comes from my character and faith. These days, it is rare to be around a group of guys who truly care about each other and want the best for each other. In this program, we have found that you find the most joy in life when you are not thinking about yourself, but when you are thinking about other people. To the IWU community and students, I want to thank you guys for your support throughout these four years. Uh, I can't tell you how much fun it is to play in front of a loud crowd at Lucky Arena. Just hearing that noise and um, energy from the stands gives you so much confidence to play in. You guys are a huge reason for the now 49 home wins in a row. I've enjoyed building a relationship with so many of you. I want to give a special shout out to my teammates. Just growing, going through the grind every day with you guys is a blessing. I also want to shout out some of my older teammates who came before me and set the way. Jacob Johnson, Ben Carlson, Trevor Wade, Joel Okafor, Evan Maxwell, Kaney Toffee, and Trevor Harrell. You guys have all showed me different qualities of what true leadership looks like. Also, I want to thank the coaching staff, Coach T, Coach Clark, Dio, uh, you guys have instilled confidence in me from when you first started recruiting me. I really appreciate how you guys have challenged me each year to grow further in my character. It's not just basketball with you guys, but it's building up men to lead in their families and communities one day. Lastly, my family. Thank you to my mom and dad for the way that you guys raised me and loved me through the up and downs. I have cherished your guidance every step of the way. To my brother Jake, thank you for being my role model growing up. I honestly think you are one of the best one-on-one -on -one players I have ever faced. I really think the competition you provided growing up helped me get to where I am today. I have realized a couple things being part of this program. First, while the points and wins are fun, it is more, it is more important to be a person that positively impacts others. And secondly, it's not about thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less and others more. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I have tried to live this verse out and accomplish these things during my time here at IWU. Again, thank you all for being here today. I will never forget the memories that I have made with you all. Our coaches always say you have been handed a heritage, you will leave a legacy. I look forward to coming back here in the next few years and seeing how these guys, my teammates, are continuing to build the legacy of Indian Western basketball. Thanks again. University of Rio Grande. I'd like to thank Brad Peterson who created this award of progress. And uh, I'd like to thank our committee who spent hours and hours watching video, watching games, helping us with the watch list. Our committee is a national committee consisting of coaches at the NAI level, Division II, Division III, even the USCA and NCCA level. They poured in a lot of time and effort into this. I'd like to thank Rick Wagner who created the video of the finalists and uh, the video that you've seen here. Um, of Kyle, and uh, I'd like to thank Steve Gidley for all of his help in arranging today. I'd like to 
thank Greg Conagal uh, for all that he does for our game and uh, for doing it the right way. It's a pleasure to watch. And I really like to thank Jeff Lanham, uh, who believed in this vision of this award and what it stands for from the very beginning. Obviously, he has a personal relationship both with the University of Rio Grande and with Devo Francis himself. But he believed in this award from the very beginning. And today, this has become the most prestigious award in all of college basketball for current players in America. Finally, Kyle is the Bevo Francis Award winner. You've obviously cemented your place in college basketball history. You now carry, carry with you a piece of the legacy of the great Bevo Francis himself. And you carry with you a responsibility of representing this award with dignity and class. And obviously, from everything that we have seen and know, uh, that will be taken care of. We are so proud of the person that you are. We've done an incredible amount of research on you, and uh, it's just impressive the human being you are. I'm highly impressed with the word that keeps popping up about you, and that's humility. For everything that you've accomplished, we continue to thank your teammates, your coaches, your parents. Um, your humility is incredibly impressive. And I'm impressed to learn about the mutual love between you and your teammates. I sincerely appreciate and congratulate you on winning the 2020 uh, Bebo Francis Award. This legacy is something you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today and all of you for watching this live presentation of the Bebo Francis Award. Once again, and finally, please join me in a round of applause for the 2020 Bebo Francis Award winner, Kyle Mangus. retiring after this year. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been warned.
never responded to it, so I don't know if he laughed or what.